Good morning. I want to uh, just welcome you to our Good Friday service. And uh, my name's David, and I'm obviously the, I'm the vicar of Holy Trinity Barnes. How you found us, uh, uh, I don't know that, but I'm just really pleased if you if you're joining us online, if you're part of our uh, church family of Holy Trinity Barnes, just welcome on this Good Friday. And we're just going to spend a bit of time. Uh, worshipping uh, together, there'll be an opportunity to do that, and then we're going to hear a word from uh, Michaela Copsey, and then there'll be some time to uh, reflect. But I, I don't know when you first heard the story of the cross, the story of Easter week, and uh, I know that I first heard the story when I was a small child at primary school, and my primary school teacher in a tiny little village in Scotland uh, read the Easter story and I remember it, it, it churning my heart, my little whatever I was, five years of age, six years of age heart and I came back uh, and the thing that struck me about the Easter story was the, the, that they let, uh, I said to my mother as I walked into, into tea, at tea time, I said to her, they let the bad man go and the good man had to die. And obviously it was years later that I, I comprehended what, what, what I'd heard and what I'd been shown. Because of course Barabbas got set free and, and Jesus uh, died. And, uh, and I, we revisit that. Every Good Friday we revisit the story of the cross, that key event in human history. And we let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and this year it's exceptional times isn't it that we are all uh, at home and I, and I just pray I'm going to pray for us now that as you give yourself time to reflect on the cross to worship to bring your life before Jesus this Good Friday I pray that you would encounter him I pray that he would fill you with the Holy Spirit I pray that you would know his goodness so let me pray Father, thank you that this Good Friday, as we hear of you, as we encounter you, as we hear from your word, as Michaela brings that word, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us, and that you would do a work of grace in our hearts, in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we're going to we're going to worship together. Hello, good morning. It's so good to have you with us. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Um, hope you've had your coffee. If not, grab one now. It's perfect time just before you start singing. Get a bit of milk on the old vocal cords. But um, we're going to start with a kids' song. Uh, this particular song is a song which I loved as a child when I was going to church. Uh, so it means so much to me on a personal level as well. It's called Shine Jesus Shine. So it's a major major throwback. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy it. Cheers. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of your dark is shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me.
then sings my soul by the Savior God to me. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul by the Savior God to me. How God the Son of Sparing sent him to die. All his cross can take it in. That on that cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died. Sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How Shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then shall I bow in humble adoration and the good How God, how great thou art! Then sings my soul. The reading comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 19, verses 16 to 30. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with, with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put, and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests and the, of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written. I have written. So when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill what the scripture uh, had said. They divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing beside the cross of Jesus were his, mother, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to, this, to, his, to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, 
It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Good morning, church family. Um, it's so nice to be able to uh, get to share with you all this Good Friday uh, morning. Um, it's sad that we are scattered around the city in our own homes and that we can't be together physically, but I'm really thankful um, that we can be together online. Um, I have loved seeing the different updates from uh, church members over the last few weeks, just seeing some of the, uh, the joys and the challenges that different individuals and families are going through during this unique time. So thanks for sharing those um, and keep them coming. This morning, um, being Good Friday, we obviously want to um, talk about the death of Jesus. And um, it's interesting that it is called Good Friday because it doesn't feel like a Good Friday. Um, five years ago on Good Friday, my eldest son was born in the early hours of the morning. And after a very long, um, uncomfortable pregnancy and being overdue, um, in the agony of labor, that day felt like a Good Friday. I could rest in bed um, with my newborn son and, um, yeah, just enjoy holding his precious, perfect little body. That really felt like a Good Friday. Um, but for the mother of Jesus and for his friends um, who were standing beside the cross, cowering in their hiding places across the city, um, and the disbelief and confusion over what was going on that Friday probably felt like the most awful of days. At the moment, um, when we put our kids to bed at night, we read a few stories with them and then we let them choose a Bible story to finish the evening with to try and sort of wind them, <laughs> wind them down from the chaos of the day and get them ready for bed. And the story that my boys have been choosing... Um, must be for over a month at the moment, is the death of Jesus. That's the story that they request to read. And I must admit, I've attempted um, to steer them towards other stories. <laughs> um, but this is the story that they want over and over again. And in their little Bible, which is called the Jesus Storybook Bible, some of you guys might have that in your homes. Um, this story is called The Day the Sun Stopped Shining. And as we read through this story, we spend a lot of time inspecting each one of the wounds and scars that's depicted on Jesus' body. We spend time talking about why these people would want to kill Jesus. Um, and, we, and we talk about how that crown of thorns must have felt on his head. And to be honest with you, I really don't like discussing these details of death and pain with my three and five-year-olds. Um, in this particular chapter, um, in their Bible, the story stops um, as Jesus' body is taken down from the cross and buried in the tomb. And the chapter ends by saying they rolled the stone over the tomb and nobody could get in and nobody could get out. And that's where the story ends. And I'll be honest with you, I really struggle to stop reading there. I, I find it too painful, too disappointing for um, this epic story of Jesus' miraculous birth and um, his teachings and his life on earth to end in this um, sad and, and awful way. His, his horrible death, his followers scattered and hurting, his mother weeping over her son, um, and then his body laid in a grave and that's it. It feels like defeat. It feels not only like the sun stopped shining, but like the sun is never going to shine again. And out of the discomfort of being left in the sorrow that is Good Friday, I find myself reading the first part of the next chapter to them. I want to quickly get to the bit where Jesus um, rises again. I don't want to dwell in the pain of death. In a matter of seconds, um, I keep reading and Jesus is alive again. Phew. He's back with his friends. He's cooking them breakfast. He's showing them his scars. He's reminding them that everything is going to be okay. And aren't I just a product of my generation that doesn't like to wait? We like instant gratification. We aren't used to waiting on very much these days. And if we have to wait, then we like to lean on our other crutches, 
and we want to be distracted, we want to be entertained, we want to somehow avoid or numb the pain and the waiting. We distract our anxious minds with something more upbeat, more fun, um, a le- maybe even just a late night buried in work or a long Netflix binge. But the reality for those disciples that day, the reality for Jesus' mother, is that they didn't just flip the page to the happy ending. They could not dull the sting of death that day. They waited it out in sorrow and despair. For three days, in fact. Why? Why did God allow the world three, three days to come to their own conclusions about who Jesus was and how he failed? He allowed the world to grieve the loss of their Messiah and to sit in the confusion and hopelessness. Why? What was that all about? Clearly, God is not uncomfortable with our questioning, our confusion, our sorrow, or our despair. God allows us to wait on the hope to be made visible. And I think sometimes as Christians, we can feel like we need to have the answers. We feel like we need to be able to explain the catastrophes and the sorrows of the world around us. Maybe we feel like we need to defend God. Maybe we feel like we need to be the, the upbeat ones with something, something positive, um, something to distill the confusion. I think mostly it comes out of a motivation to want to help people, but sometimes I think it also comes out of a discomfort with facing the suffering and pain. And in recent years, um, I have been learning what it means, what it means to hold a space for sorrow, to find hope before the happy ending arrives. If you guys know, um, you guys don't know me too well in the church yet, um, but some of you might be familiar with the personality typing um, called Enneagram. And if you are familiar with that, then I will, um, I wanted to share with you guys that I am at Enneagram 7. Sevens are the ultimate in pain avoidance. We will tell the joke, we'll put on a smile, we'll find the silver lining. Um, and while having a, an upbeat, energetic friend can be a gift, the older I get, the more I realize a good friend also makes space for grief. A good friend has the honest conversations and makes a safe space to name emotions, to name losses without feeling this need to always remedy and explain away the challenges that we face in our lives. And if I want, if we want to be friends that can do that, then we need to be people who practice it in our own personal lives. This has been a real challenge for me um, over the recent years. To move in proximity to suffering is not my natural tendency. But over the last, um, the last several years, as I have encountered sorrow and grief around me, and more significantly, as people close to me have faced huge losses in their lives, I have been on a journey of learning what it means to hold the space, to not have to offer words or explanations, to not have to make it better, but just to make space, to hold the space of the grief and the sorrow and the pain, to listen, to be present, um, but just to hold that space. Isaiah 53 describes Jesus as acquainted with sorrows. We see throughout Jesus's life that he um, makes space to feel the emotions of life. When Lazarus dies, Jesus weeps. He is about to raise this guy from the dead and he doesn't just skip to the part of resurrection. He takes the time to grieve the loss of his friend. He faces all the emotion welling up in his heart and he weeps. As night closes in and Jesus knows his arrest and death is coming imminently, he spends time crying out to the Father. If there's any other way, he says, he feels the emotion and the weight of what he is going to endure. He grieves. And... At the same time, he is also faithful to what God has called him to do. He says, your will, not mine. I think sometimes as Christians, we feel like that if we don't have all the answers and if we're filled with sorrow and grief, that we aren't also filled with faith, that we aren't trusting God enough. But scripture shows us time and time again that grieving is not the opposite of hope, that we can give space to the sorrows that that we face in our lives and in the world around us and 
at the same time we can be the people that God has called us to be? What would happen if we lent into the discomfort and pain? What would happen if we named those yucky feelings, despair, confusion, numbness, overwhelmed? N.T. Wright in his recent article for Time magazine writes, Lament is what happens when people ask why and they don't get an answer. And perhaps this season that we find ourselves in is a season to learn the practice of lament. Lament is biblical. We see it all throughout scripture, this place of expressing our sorrow and despair and confusion and loss. And in the midst of that, naming the truth of who God is. He is faithful. He is sure. He is everlasting. He is the comforter, redeemer. He is God with me. I might feel powerless about the COVID-19 situation in my country and how this is affecting the vulnerable. And... I know that God is powerful and he works in our city. The two aren't opposite. They can coexist together. For our family, we might feel overwhelmed when we think of friends and community we left behind in Cape Town. We, we grieve that loss and we know that God is here with us in our new home in London. Just as a side note, I, I like to practice using the word and instead of but because but sometimes makes it feel like we're negating those feelings. We shouldn't feel that way. And and to me invites us to hold that tension of the expression of emotion um, and the truth of who God is. James K.A. Smith in his book, You Are What You Love, this is what he writes. He says, even mourning takes practice. Resisting the distractions that insulate us from facing up to the tragedy in the world in which we find ourselves. We need to teach our children to mourn for neighbors who bear the brunt on injustice, even though we grieve as those with hope. Sometimes in this fallen world, the best thing we can do is teach our children how to be sad. And I've been really challenged as a parent, um, and especially in this season of transition for us, to make space for my kids to feel and discuss the sadness that they are experiencing Um, They've lost friends. They're confused about the world that they've entered here. And we do them a disservice if we try and just gloss over those feelings. And we've been practicing giving them space to feel what they feel when they want to talk about it. And we practice remembering who God is in our lives. We grieve and we grieve as those who have hope. And the hope that we have is found in the tragedy and beauty that is Good Friday. So as we conclude today, I just want to draw our attention to Jesus' last words on the cross. As he cries out in anguish, he says, It is finished. And this this phrase, it is finished, comes from the Greek word teleo, which means to bring an end, to complete, or to fully accomplish. It's the same kind of thing you might shout as you cross over the finish line of a marathon. It's the same kind of notion as you stand on that stage and receive a diploma at the end of your degree. It essentially means I have accomplished the entire work that I set out to do. I have done exactly what I planned to do and it is done. This is our hope. The disciples might have been left in that moment in confusion and fear, and fear, but Jesus on the cross knew he had faithfully carried out his purposes on earth. Hope for the disciples was accomplished on that cross, even though they didn't realize it, even though they didn't see it until the resurrected Jesus came to to them face to face. Before Jesus left them, before his death, he told his disciples, you will have sorrow in this world, but take heart, I have overcome. Jesus does not wait until the resurrection to say it's finished. It's in the middle of the pain and anguish. He says, I've came what I, came, I, I have done what I came to do and it's finished. Jesus, not death, had the last word. Jesus, not death, still has the last word. The curtain is torn. The chasm that was, that was created in the garden is mended. The redemption of the world is in motion on the cross. Not three days later, not as we wait, but on that cross. And yet the world waits for the evidence. The world waits in the abyss of death for the evidence of the resurrected Jesus. 
what looks like death that day is in fact the path to resurrection life. And this Good Friday, we find ourselves in a, in a unique space. We find ourselves in the midst of a global crisis. And everywhere we look, it feels like fear and death. We can't be together. We, we read the news and there is much to grieve about. I know many of you have other things going on in your lives, other challenges and crises. Let us be a people who make space for lament. Let us be a people who make space for the expression of true emotion. And as we do so, let us grieve as people who have hope, who have a savior who endured the cross, who though acquainted with sorrow was victorious over death. The sting of death was finished on that cross and what looks like sorrow to the world in the kingdom is the very same place that we find hope arising. So I hope that is an encouragement and a blessing to you um, each in your homes today. And I'm just going to close with a prayer as we finish this Good Friday. Jesus, on this Good Friday, we think of you and we think of the pain that you endured on the cross. Not only on the cross, but in all the time leading up to the cross, the accusations, the shame, the pain of knowing what was coming your way. And Jesus, today we grieve over what you went through. We thank you that you were willing to walk the road of suffering in order to defeat death, in order to redeem us and give us a hope and a future. And we think today of your disciples and friends who on the day of your death were just left questioning, grieving, feeling like all hope was lost and the future was so uncertain. And Lord, we identify with some of those feelings. And we thank you, Lord, that on the other side of their despair was you, Lord, was your love, that even though they couldn't see it yet, that the victory had already been won. And Lord, I pray that you teach us how to be people who hold the space of grief and emotion in our lives, people who listen well and acknowledge truthfully the place we find ourselves. And Jesus, enable us to be people who stand securely on the truth of who you are, that are not swallowed up by those emotions, but are secure in who you are and the victory that you have already won on the cross, Jesus. As we walk through this difficult part of the church calendar, awaiting resurrection, teach us something about awaiting the the evidence of hope. Teach us something about grieving as people who have a hope. And Jesus, we just pray your blessing over each person and each family that is gathering with us today. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, Lord, that you are victorious. In Jesus' name, amen.
encourage you just to take some uh, space, um, which was a word that Michaela used on a couple of occasions in her talk. Just some space to uh, uh, reflect on the cross. And she uh, started her talk at the beginning. She said, um, she said a little phrase, everything is going to be okay. And, and I just want you to, to take that phrase in the midst of whatever you feel you're carrying um, on this Good Friday, just that truth as you meditate on the cross. And the second thing that, that, that Michaela said is it's okay to have emotions, it's okay to have some doubts, it's okay that you maybe can't explain everything uh, at the moment and she said there's also a place and space for sorrow and grief and if you know you're you're carrying that you're that this is the the day this is a time to lay that before the feet of Jesus at the cross and I want to just uh, pray uh, for us now just uh, uh, a blessing and and just take that word it is finished. It's finished. Jesus' words at the cross in the midst of what he gave to us, his last words were, it's finished. And I pray your blessing, the blessing of the, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit this day.